Mm, that's true. So yeah. just talk about this picture. <laughs> this see. picture is, is one of my favorite pictures that I've ever seen, actually, because it shows Kenya just after getting independence and any country just after getting independence was a great time for them at that time. But what it shows is that, uh, to me, is that how power never leaves hands. It's a guarantee that you're, you're, the power is going to be in the hands of pretty much the same people. So Kenya has been independent for over 50 years. They've had four leaders in that 50 years. And in that one picture, was, which was taken 50 years ago, you've got all four leaders that Kenya has ever had. You've got Daddy Kenyatta, yeah. then you've got Moi, and then you've got Kibaki. And holding the hand of our leader today is his father, Kenyatta, and that's uh, Uru. Uh, so um, power, hard for it to change hands. Mm -hmm. Great picture. As a businessman in Kenya, do you find that politics affects you directly? Is like, is it quite unstable? Is it stable? Depending, it's stable and it's unstable, depending on um, the political situation. And there's, as you know, Simon, there's a hell of a lot of outside political pressures here um, for, for, for Kenya to follow suit, for example, in COVID um, and, and everything else. The terrorists, when it was terrorism running around the place, uh, in the West, uh, they wanted Kenya to get involved in it. So some guys threw a couple of grenades into a church or a mosque, and then we can say, hey, don't go to Kenya until they follow suit, basically. So politics is always there, but I don't follow it anywhere in the world because at the end of the day, I've still got to pay my rent and feed my family, yeah? How long have so you I been, how long is your, how long you been in Kenya and how long have you had this business? I've been in Kenya 12 years, basically, and been in biz at this business 12 years. Okay, so when you got up there, so did you have time for due diligence or were you relying on your wife? Your wife's Kenyan, correct? Yeah, when you say due dil diligence, what do you mean relying on due diligence? All right, when you do due diligence, you start to understand the culture. So from when I came to Kenya, um, uh -huh. it took me a couple, two to three years before I actually decided what I was going to do. Oh, I no. travelled around the country to well to the main capitals. To obviously, I was in Mombasa. I went to Nairobi, just yeah, got yeah. a feel, just observed. I did a tourist thing, but at the same time, I stayed in the poor parts. I understand. We had a mass of people where because of, Kenya's got forty percent unemployment, and so I just took in all the information and I tried to find out if there's any research companies um, uh -huh. in Kenya which could do due diligence for you based on what you want to do, but there was nothing to hand. No, there was nothing. one or two, but they weren't recommended. They were like, mm, they just kind of took your money and run kind of situation. I, I get what you mean. I get what you mean. Yeah, we did do our uh, so research. We did some research before we came here. I had some friends, who I, uh, Kenyan friends who I knew in, in London mm -hmm. anyway. Oops, sorry, I've got the sun in the back there. Sorry, some Kenyan friends who I knew in London and they gave me some good advice. Ladies who, middle, middle class ladies who spent a lot and went to salons and all the rest of it, pharmacies. So we did some and we did some on the ground when we came here. So we did do a little bit, but I would advise anyone, and this is going to any country, it's good to do that due diligence because I've always said a great company, at least when I came here 12 years ago, when internet wasn't so popular and all these Amazon type companies were not really around, something like Argos would have been a good company to do, good kind of business to do, where you just got a small space in the heart of Nairobi, the heart of Mombasa, you got a few products on the shelf and uh, you got catalog type, type setup, yeah? And so what you do is you import over a whole load of flat pack stuff, furniture and things like that. But you've got somewhere out, out the outer skirts of Nairobi or Mombasa, a big kind of like warehouse. Or so you don't even really need a big warehouse. You could have a massive house, quite a big house for a reasonable price. And uh, you convert one or two of the rooms into like a warehouse type thing because flat packs, they don't take up much space. Mm -hmm. Then what you do, you, you, you sell it to these, this middle class of ladies and uh you know good jobs and all that and then they buy it and you deliver it there's a there's a charge there then they're going to want it made up there's a small charge there also did mm -hmm. you get so that i always thought that would have been quite a good business to have 
something mm-hmm. like that. I still think it is not a bad business. Mm-hmm. Looking on that note, what would you do differently? And what would be the future if you could, if you had to change business? Uh, well, what I would probably say, if I, <laughs> that, I would probably maybe try to set up a school a school use my teaching skills my teaching degree to, to set, teacher is, yeah science teacher secondary school in london in fact yeah science we may so, be able to do a collaboration there because when i came come back i have my community interest company aspire youth africa and it'll be a trade school and science would be a good section to have within that not bad yeah so so yeah probably a school because I, I still think it's the greatest job in the world, teaching young people, teenagers in particular. Very rewarding. Um, yeah, so maybe I'd have went for a school if I was to do something again. again what else would I possibly go into? A school, something like school. School, yeah, school. Or maybe facials and improving people's face. Or really just before coming over, get real qualifications in, in hair, lots of experience i did some work in some salons and stuff but and really hit it hard and do the things that people uh, cannot do i mean it's not even too late now because there's a lot of people who can do hair but there's not many people who are repairing damaged hair and scalp Mm -hmm. okay now tell us about the culture of mombasa and what it's like well i mean in general just as a general thing i love the place because I think it's so peaceful. I call it, I call it a, a little town with zero crime rate. The crime rate is so small to me from what I see here. It's not really worth worrying about. Women can leave my shop at 10 o'clock at night on their own, go home safely. And they're not in no fear of, of getting harassed, raped or attacked or anything like that. So that part of Mombasa, I really do love. Um, the culture is quite slow moving. People are in no rush. People don't get under any stress, as I think we've talked about before. Things like road rage is non-existent here. They haven't got any time for somebody's bad driving to give them a bad day. They just uh, dust themselves off. Yes, you're laughing. No, yeah, <laughs> I, was, I, I, I did catch myself in some uh, <laughs> positions. Go on. Yeah, so they just dust themselves up and said, oh, that's a, another dumb Matatu driver, another dumb bike rider, another dumb pedestrian, lorry driver, whatever. And they just get on with it. And I kind of really, really, it took me years to understand why these guys were just taking everything on the chin like that. Then you realize this is actually the right way of doing things. It's not like us in London who's getting irate over small little things, which are not any game changers at all. So I, I like that about them. The food is not my favorite food. I find it very bland. But fortunately, my partner is someone who was with me in London. So um, she understood, understands the flavors and the flavorings and stuff that we use, seasonings and stuff. So the food I get is great stuff, just as great as when I was in the UK at home. But out there, uh, it's not so fantastic. As you, as you know, uh, it's part Muslim, part uh, Christian, and uh, I think they get on perfectly well together. I really I, do. And I'm Don't not sure if you're me. sorry there, just to jump in. I'm not sure if you're aware. Do you know about? I think it's a third of Kenya are still <laughs> in the traditional beliefs before the Christian and, and the Muslim. Didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the northeastern section. Yeah, it's oh, quite yeah. a it's quite a uh, a decent chunk. I that is. It, in the picture, we've got Maasai, yeah. um, and there's M- Mombasa Town Centre. Yeah, Are you a beach stuff. life person? No. Why? The beaches are second to none. <laughs> Is that what? I don't know why. Listen, you know, those beaches. Ah, oh, it's perfect. Oh, you like the beaches? That's at Diani side, I would say. Isn't it? Or, or places like Mombasa, Mombasa. Beach Hotel. Yeah. Oh, that's Maasai. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but a lot of people go there. What is it about, I have to ask, what is it about the beach you don't like? 
What is it? What is it about the beach I don't like? No, it's not that I don't like the beach. What I like is secluded beaches. I'm a quite pri a private, quiet kind of guy who likes to just relax and and have time to think, right? So seeing the sea, seeing woodlands and all that kind of stuff, I kind of like it. But a beach which is filled with people, I don't have that much interest in walking on the in the sun just to see a whole load of people where you can see them in cities and then everywhere else. So for example, when I went and visited another Jamaican friend, uh, Jamaican friend in Watamu, there was some beaches there which are secluded. You're pretty much near enough on your own there. I like that. Mm. I like that. But being a, a Jamaican, you know, we're kind of still fearful that a shark might jump out somewhere. Uh, even though it might not be shark infested waters. No, so we don't there, are. there are. There are. There's sharks across the reef. So I swim across the reef. I snorkel. And I haven't bumped into a shark. I've bumped into a mantis stingray, sea turtle, seahorse, a dragonfish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of jellyfish. But Great. there's reef sharks. And, um, uh, and there's the biggest um, whale shark in the world. Is there? Yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah, so I do love the beach. It's not that I don't love the beach, but I just don't like going there where there's lots and lots of people, like pirates, for example. Yeah, you won't be on pirates, sure. <laughs> no, not not easily, unless I'm with Chris walking by and him, him showing me different businesses and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I just want to be at Pirates Beach. It's a crowded beach. You yeah, like it? Are. That's my. <laughs> Oh, there it is, yeah. That was Christmas, that is day, it? Christmas Day. Christmas Day, During yeah. During the lockdown. Amazing. During the lockdown. In now Paris, you see, I, I mean, I would have no fun there. Privacy, the sand. Exactly. <laughs> Great, though, isn't it? And look, every people in their Sunday best. Oh, yeah. Those are the cultural differences that I've realised. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they're people who've never seen the sea before. Okay. And uh, they come from inland because Africa's a lot bigger than people realise. They've got um, true, and they've never seen the sea, and they're just very curious. And yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, an it's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. So, what's the future hold for you? The future holds in me for me. Well, we're in COVID times, and of course, there is a a shift of everything now. Um, so the bottom line is we all have to find different ways of doing things and different outlets and competition, especially somewhere like Kenya, it's very, very tough because many things are not rigorously regulated. So as a result, we have to find different areas in which to, to, to do things. I'll probably remain in beauty, but I'll probably incorporate the pharmacy and the teaching stuff a bit more. Like, as I said, maybe we were talking about teaching young people a bit of hair. I'm um, teaching people more about their face, what they can do for themselves, what we can do for them. And things like locks where, where we can use natural products on, on, on doing it, facials and things like that. That's the areas that. So we're going to incorporate more of a medical uh, and knowledge-based type um, hair and beauty setup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. So when their students come to you at present, are they getting a sitting and guild certificate? What kind of certificate are they getting? To be honest with you, because we like to be trans, you know, transparent and completely open and honest. The UK, the, 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 the German, the American qualifications that a lot of people in third world countries strive for, you're not going to easily get them here. Why? Because the, the West is not going to trust the, 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 you know, the certificate that you present to them. And to be honest with you, I didn't used to understand why, but now I fully understand. If, if you've got a certificate and, and cause even if you, if you went, someone came over to the UK with their sitting gills that they can't got from Kenya, which they used to, cause it used to be here, but it's no longer here. Simply because people were able to have a certificate. They are not very good at the practical, and when it comes to the theory, the knowledge base, they know nothing at all. So even if they were to come to the UK, to America or wherever with a sitting guild certificate, they wouldn't last in a job for very long because it'd be, it become very clear quickly to the employer that this person cannot do the job to the standard that customer is actually expected to do. Mm -hmm. So we give an internal 
qualification and an internal exam. It's not as high as a city and guilds. The questions are the same as a city and guilds, but I say it's not as high because there's not as much. Because, for example, hair, sitting gills, basic hair, two years. Beauty, basic, sitting gills, two years. That's four years. Well, in Kenya, no one really wants to do a hair and beauty course for more than six to 18 months maximum. That's a combination. So you can't cover everything. So we, we admit that we're not going to try and cover everything. But the things we cover, when you finish here, you will be able to do. Are you understanding? Yeah. Have I been in dialect with sitting in guilds, South Africa, and they represent Africa. Yeah. And um, someone actually put me personally onto this lady that they know. Mm -hmm. And what I was contemplating that they should have an African sitting in guilds standard. And reason why, mm -hmm. it's not to say it's lower, it's just mm -hmm. it takes more hands on and, and more practical for their lifestyle. Because you, because you have to feed your kids, you have to look after your family. To study in for two years or four years is a luxury. But if you I, could, I, if you could yes, condense that down, and even if you said, okay, you can carry on studying, you can work you, like six months studying, and then you go to work four days a week or Saturdays you come and carry on the study, and that goes on for some time until you get to a standard. But I was actually going to speak to something to them about that. Um, OK, my take on that is I agree with your second part where they sort of like part study, part work. That 100 percent I agree with. The part where saying we want African <coughs> city and guilds or mm -hmm. any other qualification for Africa, I don't agree with. And I can tell you why I don't agree with. If you look at, <coughs> say, a hairdressing course in the UK, and we've kind of like discussed this before. If you look at a hairdressing course in the UK, the course contains barbering, okay? Barbering. It also contains an African Caribbean section on it, African hair, yeah? And it's a big section, right? Teaching you how to do even things like braiding, uh, relaxing, flat ironing, etc. So it's, a, it's not a small section, it's a mm. big section. In fact, we use that section when we're training Africa in Kenya, we that's the main part that we use for them because we want them to understand hair. The key is the understanding and to understand how to do hair well and to do hair well or beauty well, you have to know the anatomy, physiology and that theory side. So mm -hmm. to say to a lady, we're going to teach you the practical and we're going to give you a certificate, which you can then show people and they're guaranteed that you're going to, sorry about the word, you're going to screw their hair and scalp up. I can't agree with because we already got that. Do you understand? Oh, yeah, so yeah, people are coming out with whatever they, whatever college they've gone to, and they're giving them some certificate, and it's giving them a license to screw people's hair up mm. and skin. Mm. So no, let the standard be what it is. Kenya will have to catch up to understand that this is the level mm. we can train you it, <clears throat> just like a student a young girl of maybe 15, 16 who wants to study, but they only study in their summer holiday, their school holidays. But the level, the standard has to be one which, even if they don't get a certificate where they could come to the UK, for example, and do hair, they still could do a friend's hair without messing it up. Do, do you understand? Mm -hmm. No, so I understand that, and you're perfectly right. It's not my business. It's your mm -hmm. profession, and I've been enlightened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So don't, don't come to them with that, because... If they agree, to me, I see them as being disrespectful to Africa mm. because they know it's not the right way to go. Mm. You know, they know it's not the right way. The way to go is for us to step up our standards and our expectations mm. of, what, what, you know, what we want. Yeah. The, the only thing I could think to that <clears throat> would be to have different levels so you could break it down for more. It's already there. Oh, is it? It's, there, okay. kind of. it's okay. already there, yeah. E even the Kenyans themselves, they got this to level one, two, and three. So that's there again. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's already in place. What we do need is, you see, the thing is, even if you have that, what you've got to have is qualified teachers. Like, for example, me, I'm, I, I've got a science degree, so I suppose, so, and a teaching degree. So you're able to teach. And you're able to understand the science of it, because when you break all of these things down, 
it comes, Simon, into the science. <laughs> Again, you can't get away from it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so yeah. for example, I've been able to teach things, right, which I can't practically do myself. Sounds ridiculous. But if you understand the Alex Ferguson scenario, and I'm not comparing myself to that great coach, leader, but he was a, he's able to teach people to do amazing things with a football, which he had never been able to do himself. But his job is not to do that. His job is to teach it to people who's got more talent in it than themselves and allow them to do it. That's an interesting stage because they say that people who can't do teach. But my last question to you, you've been a great guest, is what would be your advice to someone who's considering to come to Africa or Kenya and start a business? Your key words of advice. My key words of advice from what I can see in on my own personality is um, before you do anything, you're really supposed to look into it a bit. And uh, I mean, I, I think this COVID is a great eye opener in, in the sense that it allows you to understand which countries has actually got a sort of independent leader. Okay, which countries African countries included, and they sort of got an independent leader. In other words, a leader who, okay, we've got to follow these rules and regulations that the international uh, body has put down on us. But within those rules and regulations, how can we still play this so that our economy doesn't completely crash, our people have still got hope, and things are still moving, right? And so as a result, I'm not going to say to anyone, you should come to Kenya. There are other African countries that you can go to, but just look and compare how the leaders are leading their country, their people, and not sort of like screwing them over. And I'm going to use that word, I'll repeat it, not screwing over the actual population because of their ignorance. Mm -hmm. So um, not necessarily if you want to come to Africa, there are other countries, 50, 50 odd of them, that you can choose from. Mm. And uh, I would say choose wisely. Okay. But at the same time, I do not have any regrets in leaving England. And just to set the record straight, uh, before COVID, I would uh, spend three months in, in Kenya and three weeks in the UK. Three months in, 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 in um, Kenya, three weeks in the UK. So you can mix and match it, play as you want. You don't have to say make a full movement. You can have your house, your base here in in uh, Africa, and you can still have a, a little base in in the UK. Mm -hmm. You can, you know it's a great world we're living in at this moment in time. You can mix and match things. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for that. We wish you well, and we look forward to having a catch up in a year's time and yeah, seeing yeah. and seeing how things go. Yeah, I appreciate Simon. It's been great talking to you. Okay. And Thanks, just man. to let you know, the audience, all the links of his of links, um, Facebook, social media site will be down below. So if you want to contact him or you're interested in doing any collaborations regarding um, beauty products, hair, and all of that, he'll be contactable um, on the links down below.